Our next speaker is um, Salim Fakir, who is the head of the Living Planets Unit at the World uh, Wide Fund for Nature in South Africa. The unit's work is focused on identifying ways to manage a transition into low carbon e economy. Um, he's an extensive writer, columnist, um, and has also worked as a senior lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch. But I'll hand over to Salim. Thank you. Secondly, I think that uh, when I was sitting and listening to uh, the previous speaker, what struck me about the Karoo, and perhaps uh, it's implicit in, in what people have been saying, is that uh, we have a wonderful uh, evidence of uh, the Earth system itself uh, uh, during uh, of millions of years with geological processes and biological life uh, creating in a way an artistic, an art form uh, in, in terms of the vast landscape that we have, the Karoo, that is of, of display to us, you know, here uh, to appreciate, and actually artists who have been shown earlier by uh, Virginia, uh, who uh, um, tried to replicate uh, uh, that process uh, that, have taken, that has taken place uh, over millions of years. And uh, I think that's a very profound um, uh, sense of uh, appreciating what is visible today but has taken place even before human beings uh, arrived on Earth. Uh, and I think what we are tr trying to debate today is actually uh, a process that, is, uh, that has taken millions of years, the aesthetics of that, and the potential destruction of, of that uh, through a very intrusive uh, technological process uh, and essentially, one can debate endlessly whether it's about development, or whether it's about profits, or whether it's about uh, something else, uh, saving people, uh, etc. And I'll show you through work we've done, um, the economic work that we've done, that uh, uh, despite what Shell says, uh, the, the president of Shell, Bonang Mahali, who says that he will leave the Karoo better than it was before. <laughs> so I find it very remarkable that uh, you can replicate millions of years, millions of years of processes by 10, 15 years of intervention it will make it look better than uh, it was before. This is says currently in debates, and I've been in one debate where he actually was trying to convince uh, people that that's actually what Shell is, is, is capable of doing. Uh, but we know that's not true. Um, so I'll take this down. So just to describe, uh, I think uh, the work that I'm, I'm going to present to you is really, uh, I'll try to do it in 10 slides, not, not more than that, just to give you the essence of it, is really an uh, embodiment of different information that we've had to work with, uh, that's geological information, understanding of the petrochemical uh, industry, uh, understanding the technology itself, and uh, the environmental challenges, and trying to uh, piece all of that together to, to get an understanding of the, the economics of this. And partly it's because we want to, just like we, we have a topic here called uh, Peru Disclosure, we try to sort of break the asymmetry that exists between the companies that hold the information about the com commercial viability and what we uh, can understand as, as being actually a, a very challenging uh, uh, process to actually make commercially viable. Uh, because uh, what we are 
in at the moment is that uh, the reason why we, we're fracking it and trying to extract shale gas is the majority of uh, the most lucrative uh, oil and gas uh, reserves around the world are actually owned by gov governments. Uh, it used to be the case that uh, private multinational companies, uh, historically, what they used to call the seven systems like Shell, uh, BP, etc., uh, dominated uh, this industry for a long time. And of course, governments woke up to the fact that this is a national resource. It is uh, as huge uh, revenue streams, uh, which they want to have control over. And so 70% of the world oil and gas today is controlled by governments. Uh, and because those are the most uh, cheapest to produce, uh, oil companies ha that uh, don't have easy access to those, or all the profits that uh, can accrue to them, traditionally will have to look for other reserves outside of what they call conventional resources. So what we're dealing with here is a resource which is unconventional at what is called frontier petroleum and gas reserves where you have to spend a lot more money uh, and actually try to unlock uh, oil and gas from very difficult uh, environments and geologi uh, geological uh, formations. And because of that, it uh, costs a lot more money to, to do it. And because it costs a lot more money, the oil and gas price has to be high enough for it to be uh, sufficiently viable economically. If anything goes, uh, like we've seen now with oil prices going from $120 a barrel up to $40 uh, a barrel, it <coughs> increases the non viability, so it reduces the non viability of uh, shale and gas. And because of the frontier technologies uh, 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 reserves, the oil and com companies, oil and gas companies, are desperate to find new reserves in order to be able to keep the <coughs> companies viable. The more they can de declare proven reserves, the more the commercial viability of the company uh, improves. If they cannot uh, replace uh, the oil and gas reserves over time, uh, their shareholders start getting nervous and the share prices start moving in the wrong direction. Uh, and so you can see the desperation to, to find uh, uh, these reserves. So over millions of years ago, uh, uh, the um, uh, organic material, uh, which is uh, plant material, forest, uh, marine organisms, were buried deep uh, into the earth and sedimented and compressed uh, in a way that, uh, 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 as a result of also thermal pressure, uh, was able to convert the organic material into oil and gas. And part of the oil and gas uh, uh, moved up to the surface, closer to the Earth's surface, and th this is what, uh, and then pulled into a, 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 a reservoir, uh, as you can see uh, in one year, which uh, uh, created uh, large volumes that were tappable uh, through drilling and with a lower cost. And uh, you can see for gas and oil. And I'll come back to this just now. Uh, well, some of the uh, uh, the source rock, which is uh, in this case uh, shale, uh, tend to uh, also trap the remnant oil and gas, uh, which is largely impermeable and unable to move to the surface unless you frack it, unless you actually do something to uh, the geology to, to be able to <coughs> enable the oil and gas to escape uh, via artificial wells that you, you drill. So this has happened over millions of years. Um, and it goes through what is uh, called thermogenesis. Uh, this is a technical uh, term for describing a, a, a process of heating uh, uh, through a natural process of heating, particularly in the Karoo, that converts the organic material either into heavy oil, uh, light oil, uh, and then uh, into wet gas and dry gas. And because of uh, the history of the Karoo and uh, dolor, dolor, doloretic uh, intrusions and other geological processes, it's more likely that what we are dealing with is high uh, temperature ranges that we experience in the Karoo, where most of the organic material is most likely converted into gas. 
and this is what we are uh, talking about thermogenic uh, dry gas. So it is bacterial gas, but usually that occurs at uh, the surface of the earth, uh, closer to the surface of the earth, rather than deep down in the fluid. We are talking about uh, shale gas deposits uh, ranging uh, below a kilometer uh, or more, sometimes up to five kilometers, seven kilometers, but up to ten kilometers, depending on uh, the depth uh, that you can go into. And the more deep it is, uh, you have to drill more, to spend more money to do that. Uh, so the more it gets uh, costlier. Uh, and the way they manage to do that, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the US, where uh, most of the uh, commercially, commercial uh, extraction of shale gas has happened, is through vertical and horizontal drilling. Uh, this is pioneered uh, particularly by smaller companies like uh, Mitchell. Uh, George Mitchell was one of the pioneers in the 1990s who managed to figure out uh, the most uh, commercially viable way to drill both vertically and horizontally. And they were, this is really a technology innovation that allowed the drill bit to, while it's drilling uh, vertically down, to also be able to move uh, horizontally. And these uh, fractures, uh, sorry, this drill, which is horizontal, can go for at least 2,000 meters uh, or, or, or more, uh, depending on uh, the geology of, of the shale uh, and the, uh, the ability to be able to do that. Uh, what's important about uh, shale gas is that you have to do both a vertical and a horizontal drill. Uh, and, but you don't actually know how much gas or oil you have until you've actually fractured. And currently, uh, despite what people tell you, uh, what is uh, the, the best frac fluid because of the chemicals that you have to meet, uh, mix? It's a little bit like mixing a, a soup of chemicals uh, uh, through understanding what the geology is. If it's uh, clay soil uh, or uh, mineralized in a particular way, or has calcite or other types of uh, mineralogy, that determines the chemical compositions that need to be mixed with the water to be able to create a, a proper frac uh, so that you can create a lot of permeability and the ability of the gas and oil to be able to escape uh, in the most efficient uh, way. So you, you, uh, the, the amount of water that you use is largely dependent on the depth of the well and the horizontal uh, well that you, you've created. And uh, uh, the important thing to remember is that usually uh, below the surface of the earth there is already what they call formation water, water that's already there uh, prior to drilling. Uh, that is also what gets mixed up with the fresh water. And when you take out that, it's a mixture of uh, both uh, contamination of the water that's already in the ground and uh, uh, the water that has come from the surface. And that polluted water is what you have to then deal with uh, afterwards, uh, which is one of the challenges that they have uh, currently uh, in, the, in the economics of shale gas. Most importantly, I think it, you need to recognize that uh, unconventional uh, drilling, which is what we have for shale, you first have to drill fracture before you actually know how much uh, gas and oil you can extract, and that determines the economic viability of the well. Uh, when they do go into the Karoo, they try to find what is called the total organic uh, content, so it shouldn't be mm -hmm. compound, the content, the TOC, and anything between 4 to 12 percent uh, per weight of, of uh, uh, per cubic uh, meter of total organic content uh, tells you the extent of uh, the richness of the organic material and the potential for high levels of oil and gas. But unfortunately, shale, uh, uh, that doesn't tell you whether uh, you will get a successful uh, uh, economic uh, reserve uh, because you have to take into account other factors, the thickness of the shale, the thermal maturity uh, of the organic material, <coughs> Uh, the rock properties, uh, both from the top of the surface and below, uh, uh, where uh, before you go into the horizontal uh, well, uh, permeability, porosity, and all other factors 
uh, would determine <coughs> the extent to which uh, a successful frack can be performed or not. So it's a, certainly a, a long way before you can actually create it economic. You can't just put up a draw and then tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, imagine that you can get a successful uh, flow of gas uh, and oil, in this case gas for the Peru, because you have to have a deep understanding of the geology. And in a way, uh, if you talk to, uh, like I've done with some of the engineers who are involved in fracking, <laughs> they repeatedly say it's a bit like an art form. So you have to be able to, this is what's interesting about it, is that because you don't actually can't see what goes on in the ground, you kind of have to imagine uh, what it looks like. Uh, and you have to design the frack in a way uh, that is more art than science. Of course you have to use science, but uh, when you actually do the fracking, uh, a lot of it is uh, based on experience and the talent of the uh, engineer that's involved in actually doing the drilling and, and the fracking process. Uh, and I'm just going to end with a slide because I think the, it's very important to understand uh, how the economics of, of shale gas works. <coughs> and I want to skip this. Uh, so first let me just say a few things here. Uh, conventional wells, uh, especially gas wells, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the recovery rate uh, of uh, gas from those wells can vary from 60 to 70%. So you can see that there's a larger volume uh, of gas that can be extracted uh, from uh, a well that is closer to the Earth's surface because it's the natural process allowed it to pool into a reservoir and there's usually a seal uh, above that that you have to break through and basically it's like a straw. You suck it out and you get what you want. And of course, if you go, once you've uh, sucked out most of it, you have to uh, it's a diminishing return. It, it becomes more costly to extract the rest of it. The difference with shale gas is that if you don't frack properly, or if your frack is not optimal, uh, your recovery rates are low. So I put you at 10 to 30 percent. Actually, when I talked to some specialists afterwards, they said I'm being too generous. I should actually talk about 5 percent uh, and, and slightly more. Uh, because when you actually do your uh, desk assessments and surveys, and seismic surveys and so on, uh, you try to estimate what is called the gas in place. What is the potential amount of gas in that rock formation in the shell? And what do you expect with uh, engineering and, and fracking solutions? How much do you expect to extract uh, from the sh uh, uh, shell formation? And that number is quite low. Uh, so it tells you the uh, important thing that uh, because the, e the economics is tough and because it's a marginal uh, resource, the less you are able to recover uh, of the gas in place, the more costly it is uh, for you. And if you don't have the ga right gas price and you haven't managed to reduce other costs uh, during drilling, the economics can be uh, quite tough. Um, uh, so you can see uh, when they actually do the uh, reserve calculations of amount of gas, they try to do uh, what is called an exponential curve. And exponential, if you know mathematics, an exponential curve is something that uh, declines gradually over time. Okay? Uh, if you've got a, a hyperbolic curve, uh, as we see for shale gas, uh, when you frack, you create, uh, it's a bit like a fizzy bottle, you shake it up, you create a lot of free gas, and there's still some uh, residual gas that is attached to the organic material. So when you have a frack and you've extracted gas, uh, most of what you extract is the free gas, and that usually happens within the first 18 months. And after that, uh, the well, uh, it becomes tougher to extract uh, the, rem uh, the remaining amount of gas. So usually these wells uh, don't last for 40 years. Don't believe anybody that tells you that. Actually, nobody knows how long they last. But what we do know is that compared to conventional wells, because of the exponential curve and the hyperbolic nature of uh, shale gas curves, they don't last very long. Uh, the first two years are when you get most of the resource. Uh, it can be from 50% up to 70 80% of the resource. So you can see that the economics of shale gas works 
a well where you have a high price and you are able to extract uh, gas as long as, as uh, over a period of time, uh, then the economics works very well. The consequence of, of this is this, these kinds of curve, curves they tell you is uh, and why you need a very large landscape is that you actually have to drill a lot. All right? You have to drill thousands of wells uh, over a very large landscape. So unlike conventional wells, which are use uh, less land uh, mass to be able to extract a large volume, uh, in the case of shale gas, you need vast amounts of expansive land uh, to be able to make up an equivalent of a conventional well uh, in terms of the amount of drilling. And so it's about drilling as much as you can over a vast amount of territory as possible uh, and as fast as you can because you have already sunk a lot of money into the ground and you have to get as much of that cash flow going uh, to be able to drill the next thousand wells over time. And that's what shale gas is all about. And this is what we found in terms of our study. But I think four important things that uh, people need to remember and, uh, around shale gas and why we think it's going to be a tough business and hard to uh, to make economic is that in, in countries outside of the US, uh, the geology needs to be understood well. Uh, the technology needs to be applied uh, and there needs to be a lot of experience. You need the right price for the gas, you need infrastructure, and you also have to deal with the environment uh, issues that are associated with it. So if you put all of that together, you have to work in a seamless way uh, that's what makes the economics work. You can make up your mind whether it will work in the pool or not. Thank you very much.